the green leaves are turning to shades of bronze and the evening air has a fresh chill. We trust that Sire Share number 33 will warm your hearts. We would like to pay homage to Stan Siegel, um, esteemed colleague, and our June 2023 Sire Share presenter, who passed away two weeks ago. Our condolences go to Stan's <clears throat> wife, Lynn, and his family. Uwe Putlitz, a good friend of Stan, remembers him. Um, Uwe? Thank you. I was appointed as the second CEO of the JPCC after Peter Bowles' retirement in 2010. The job description required the regular presentation of JBCC training courses countrywide, dealing promptly with frequently asked questions by email, the control and printing of sales of documents, and to monitor and research trends in the publication of building contracts. The Joint Building Contracts Committee consisted at the time of nine constituents representative of the building industry serving on the Technical Committee, which in turn reported to the Board of Management, both of which were shared by Stan Stiegel. All committee and board members served in a voluntary capacity, nominated by the constituent body without any form of remuneration. As may be expected, the constituents represented diverse demands for inclusion in the text of the various JBCC standard form contracts. The 2070 edition was still new at the time, but it was deemed prudent to prepare future editions to recognize changes in the industry, changes in technology, and to monitor legal challenges that might have been arising from the JBCC wording in existing documents that would be recognized in future, culminating in the publication of new documents in 2014, 2018, and 2020. As a chair of both the technical committee and of the board, Stan displayed extraordinary patience at times and skill at meetings to elicit an acceptable compromise of sometimes horrifically conflicting requirements. The CEO real role also required the liaison with many statutory and tertiary education institutions and other role players. Stan frequently found the time to join me to visit some of these institutions to show the commitment that JBCC had as an industry role player. Stan was involved and effectively represented the architectural profession on the JBCC and on PROXA committees for just short of 20 years. I was privileged to work with him and to share his experience and wisdom over 10 years. Thank you to a most generous mentor. Go well, Stan. Thank you very much, um, Uwe. Right, my name is Eugene Barnard, um, Maria Pashini from Sire's Practice Desk joins me as your hosts for the afternoon. Good afternoon, Maria. This afternoon is all about you, the Sire Share supporters. Thank you very much for joining us again this afternoon. We trust you will enjoy the event with us. Welcome behind the scenes to Karina Gibson from ECPD and in her sickbed, Marlene van Nievenhuysen from SIA. We wish um, Marlene well and a speedy recovery. Um, both render invaluable services to the SIA Share program. We invite you now to uh, post questions or comments in the questions box. Um, we will attempt to address as many questions as possible in the 10 minutes uh, at, our disposal, at our disposal. In session two, Hendrik Oret's presentation, Poetically Rescripting Architectural Heritage Resources will enchant you. We look forward to that presentation. First, however, I am privileged to welcome Uwe Putlitz back to Sire Share. Um, Uwe also participated last year and we appreciate his return. Uwe is a professional architect and construction project manager. He has experience in all 
the service contracts. He has lectured in principles of design and planning, construction technology, and commercial procedures. He has also presented the building module of the WITS Plus SAPOA property management program for 10 years. Uber was appointed the CEO of JBCC in 2010 and held office until his retirement in 2018, 2019. He has an MSc building and a BS, BARC from the University of the Witwatersrand. Uwe is retired in the Southern Cape, but remains involved in consulting in the industry. He will be addressing the topic, symptoms and remedies of failing contracts. Uwe, the screen is yours. Thank you, Eugene. Good afternoon, all. It's my pleasure to come and talk to you again on something that has concerned me over many years, the last 10 or 15 years, and that is to actually look at how to avoid disputes because they are stressful and expensive and don't achieve what we like to do, and that is to practice architecture. Very often, as a project progresses, you can see what is about to go wrong. And there are symptoms that are relatively easy to read. It's not one person that is necessarily at fault. It could be the whole industry. And it is something that with the wisdom of hindsight, we can often say, oh, if only we had reacted to that. So what I'm going to try and do is show what can go wrong and how one can possibly deal with it timelessly. Because what it's all about, after all, is to achieve the objectives of the project within the time and the budget allowed to the specified standards. That is what we would like to achieve, what our clients would like to achieve. So what are the potential problems that can go wrong? And of course, it all starts right at the beginning. Has the extent of a project process probably been quantified with no nice to haves and all the other things that people would like to have? Is subsequent work necessary to actually make this project happen? Are there things we've got to do in order for the project to be realized in the first place? What paperwork needs to be done in the background? Do we have to have special licenses? Do we need to have other special resources, skills, uh, equipment, um, money, a very important fact. And has the project support and cooperation of the stakeholders and stakeholders could be the political stakeholders, it could be the business itself, its customers, or the local community. All of these criteria need to be considered right at the beginning and failure to do so very often becomes one of the problems. Now, has this project got a bestanska? Is it justified? Does it answer the requirement that the various um, stakeholders would have or the expectations that need to be satisfied? We need to define the extent of the facilities, the type of equipment, access, and so on in great detail. Can we get the type of machinery into a building after it's been built and that sort of thing? Have we found the right location for the project? Chances are that we've got that right if we've got other things not right. Then very important, what we'd like to achieve must be defined in such a way that we can measure it and that we've got criteria to measure it against that are valid and recognized that we have a system to procure that is also transparent and is understood, and that there is an early decision made. Is it an open tender that we've got to go to? Is it a build only contract? Is it a design and build option? Because all of these will influence not only the procurement, but also the type of documentation and the type of management that is required. And with that, we need to identify risks that are likely to be encountered in the execution of this particular project. And just to emphasize stakeholders, there's a whole range of people that are affected by the project that we're busy with. So what are these potential failures? Inadequate consultation. We always do a lot of talking, but do we do the right sort of talking? Have we consulted with the end user representatives who may have particular requirements and very often are the persons best 
suited to go and tell us what works and what doesn't work. The stakeholders have already alluded to. We must also look at what we do well and what we don't do well. And is there anything that can be improved in the new facility? If I say we, that is now the team of the employer, the consultants, and maybe the contractors as well. That we've understood what resources we need to have and how susceptible is this project to the changes. There could be political changes, it could be the COVID experience we had a couple of years ago, and any other thing. Would, would that stop the project from happening, for instance? Is that one of the risks that we've got to recognize? Once we've done that, we can go and confirm in principle in formalized form, call it a brief or a charter, what this project is all about, what we're trying to achieve, what the facilities and the nature of the facilities are all about. We would like to try and anticipate the operation of this project. On paper, we can try and model and electronically these days, if we've got those sort of tools, how the final product is likely to look and more important, how it's likely to function. And we can test it if we are going to achieve whatever the objectives were before we build them and make expensive mistakes. That we can explore any design options and there may well be more than one correct solution. And we need to debate those. Is this one better than that one? Is the cheapest solution the best option? Or is maybe a more expensive solution to build actually the cheapest solution because it provides additional benefits? So as we work through the stages, we must then confirm that the project is feasible and viable. Feasible means that we can actually build it realistic with the technology that we've got available. Viable is that it, the numbers add up at the end of the day. That we have the support of the stakeholders, and that is important, not that they come back and say, oh, but we, we were never involved, this is not actually what we wanted to have that we've decided on the criteria that are important because that now gives us the first stage where we freeze the scope of this project. If we don't freeze the scope, then we will never get to a normal um, decipherable end of a particular project cycle. That we make it clear at this stage what is an acceptable standard. There are obviously better and best standards, but is that appropriate for this particular project? And somebody needs to make those decisions. And that project champion might be the owner or somebody who's been given that particular delegated power to make those decisions. And that we are aware of the business objective as distinct from the project objectives, that those two criteria actually match. As we work our way through the project cycle, we presumably have gone through the various reviews and different iterations of this project can or can't do. And all along, we actually have the opportunity to go and review the project again. And if necessary, we can go and stop it. We can maybe abort it, or we can possibly make changes. And at this stage, we are still talking about it. And we've got maybe pen to paper, but we haven't started digging in the ground and spending large amounts of money at this stage. And that we finally test what the end user is likely to want to accept and is likely to, to not come to um, afterthoughts to say, oh, we, we should have thought of this, and then becomes what is known as scope creep in the industry, which very often has some very serious delay and financial implications. So we need to have reg regular opportunities to review the project before we move to the next step. So we have gate as the project goes and gets developed. Have we looked at all the different criteria in a legal sense? Have we found any other criteria that need to be checked? What have we done to go and look at the paperwork? consulted with all the right people? Have we looked at standards that we've defined? Have we looked at what is available in the industry? Obviously, there is a time limit to all of these things. Have we realistically guessed that time? 
or is it one of those breakneck projects that's got to be ready to go and be ready at the end of September to open a shopping centre so that you get the Christmas trade and you've only got six months to build it. And then the mindset that very often employers have that we've got to appoint the lowest tender, almost regardless of how suitable that tender is for this particular project. All of these are warning signs if you are forced into that sort of situation. If we've now gone to tender, what results do we get back from the potential contractors? Is the information that we've given nicely presented, good presentation? I have all the questions that we might have asked been answered. Have they submitted all the necessary documentation of previous projects and all the rest of it? And once they appoint it, have they provided us with the guarantees? Is there a construction program? Is that construction program properly thought through or is it a sort of scrappy thing on a piece of paper that somebody has just done overnight? Appointing appointment of subcontractors, particularly nominated subcontractors. Is there any resistance to appointing particularly nominated subcontractors from the contractor? Once we've handed over the site, is the contractor getting on with the job or does it sort of start and not get any better but slows down? Do we actually see construction equipment coming onto site, whatever is necessary? Is sufficient staff on site? There may be a reason why the contractor is slurring his feet because he maybe hasn't got the money or he's overcommitted. So if at the beginning a project doesn't get going, that should also be a warning sign that it's really likely not to get any better. The employer may well be guilty of certain um, delays. If the employer delays handing over the site to the contractor, is there a good reason? Uh, maybe a valid reason that the council hasn't approved drawings, but there may be other reasons. If the employer was required to provide a payment guarantee and or proof of insurance, has he done that? Are they to the value that was specified or not? To what extent is the contract administrator appointed? And what are the powers that the contract administrator has? For contract administrator, read principal agent in the JBCC scenario, or the project manager in NEC, or the engineer in the other contracts. What about the other consultants? Have all the right consultants been appointed at the right time for the design to be sought through and documented correctly? What have we done to go and manage the communication? Who is authorized to what? Uh, does everybody get all the information? Who's got the authority to sign off certain things? And how do you have to go and get to the next level to get an approval? Do you necessarily have to go to a board level or whatever the case may be? And the important issue of issuing drawings, that those drawings are correct when they get to site. You don't want the contractor to find the mistakes in the drawing and maybe even building the mistakes. All of this, of course, has happened. Otherwise, I wouldn't mention it. Now that the contract has sort of got going, maybe the beginning isn't too bad, but then you start noticing that suddenly there are fewer people on site or the materials don't get delivered or maybe not even ordered on time that the contractor doesn't offer you any notices of delays, he doesn't ask any questions. Alternatively, from the employer side, maybe he's paid the first one or two certificates, but all of a sudden there's a delay in paying the third certificate. Uh, why? Has the, the employer now run out of money or whatever? The other thing that very often happens that all of a sudden then we make excuses that well, you know, the contractor's work isn't so good and I would have thought you would have done when that's probably without justification. And all of a sudden you've told them no, 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 we've got to make savings on this project, otherwise the viability. Well, all of that should have been sought out long before we got to this stage. 
we've spoken about the employer and the contractor, but the consulting team can also be one of those that uh, not doing what they should be doing. If you find that the consultants are slow to respond to the contractor's queries, that they're late in issuing drawings or correct drawings, it's all of this due to the fact that the fees have been cut to minimum, that you can't actually afford to go and do the job properly for the fee that you're being paid, that they suddenly don't attend site meetings anymore and always have an excuse. There's no issue of payment certificates or other certificates at the right time, that contract instructions don't get issued. It might be a site book, but that nobody does anything else about it. And meetings become uncontrollable and people don't attend. And all of these are sort of warning signs that the professional team might not be quite on the ball as one would like it to be. We then get to the next phase, that the project is behind schedule. Um, can we go and use the guarantee to go and call up because the contractor hasn't done it, assuming we followed all the steps that are defined in a guarantee, yes or no? Um, can we save the situation maybe if the contractor is short of money, that the employer makes direct payments to suppliers or subcontractors if that is appropriate? If the other ways that maybe we can help the contractor don't work too well, there's the next best option for the employer to terminate the appointment. If the contractor is struggling, we can maybe suggest that he applies for business rescue, which may be a way of dealing with it. Or the contractor might want to form a joint venture and cede some of the work to somebody else. But remember, session means he still retains the responsibility for the work that is tendered for, which is that others do it now. Or the contractor, with permission of the rest of the team, can assign the works to somebody else, in which case the contractor would relinquish his rights and obligations and somebody else now takes over from that. So those are the options that you could possibly look at at this stage. Assuming that we've now got to the dramatic stage of getting rid of contractor number one, the employer can go and call out a guarantee if he's got one. The contract administrator would have to compile a status report of what has been done successfully and what's been completed and try to, in addition to the status report, do the validation and do a draft uh, final account and sort out what needs to be done. Um, the term, Contractor one would then have to relinquish possession of the site, making sure it's clean and safe in terms of the act and so on. And that's the end of contractor one. Contractor two then must go and decide if he wants to accept the works, presumably is tendered for it, and then proceed with the works. Now, has he actually made sure that uh, what the risks are? Because what uh, contractor one has done, stays contractor one's risk and he's now responsible as if it was a new contract that he's done from the scratch. The employer in all cases must accept the responsibility to ensure the works even though he might delegate that to the contract as part of the uh, contract documents. A contract or the employer remains responsible for sorting out the occupation certificate with the local authority and there may be reasons why the local authority won't grant an occupation certificate, which goes back to what has gone wrong before. That you could have sort out the final account and that that takes an extraordinarily long time because people are arguing about all sorts of minute how that should have been solved as and when each trade got sorted out. That there's a problem with latent defects liability periods that people are no longer around who don't comply with that and of course that we don't comply with the Health and Safety Act to issue the maintenance manual and the as-built drawings and any other warranties that are relevant. If we look at the four contracts that are recognized by the, J, by the CIDB, they all have much the same requirements but they are common that you've got to comply with the law and you've got to comply with the contractual requirements in the particular documents that you've used. 
that contract administration is not something that you do in your spare time. It certainly is a full-time job and sometimes a very difficult job. And it's something that requires the keeping of accurate records in a format that can easily be read and published. And uh, that you agree the levels of authority that the parties have and that you need to speedily deal with any notifications of potential problems. And just to highlight that is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And you can't manage what you don't know. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's just take uh, uh, Niels. Um, I think um, your question has been addressed by, by Karina um, Norbert Sulik. Um, well, um, welcome from Australia, Norbert. Um, so nice to have you join us. Thank you for introducing yourself and uh, we trust you enjoy the Sire share with us this afternoon. <clears throat> Lula, um, welcome to you as well. Um, will Uwe's presentation be made available for future reference is the question and Lula, I think Karina has addressed that. Um, she will revert to you as soon as um, she has spoken to Uwe. Then Steve Archer, um, Niels Kutzer, let me just check Niels. Um, the very serious question that has never been answered is why registered com competent persons in the architectural profession do not have access to register with NHBRC and obtain a barcode. The reason for this question is that a certain size dwelling falls within the scope of SANS 10400 and deemed to satisfy rules but and within powers of the architect designer to handle as it will um you. would it be fair to ask tenders for a construction program before going sorry um we also uh, thank you for your comments um the nhbrc is a is a question which we probably need to address um I can't see that there's a particular question there. They, uh, these rules is now clearly limiting the architect's powers and allow other persons to fall into the duties. Okay. Um, Niels will attempt to uh, address that issue uh, in another uh, event. Um, Alan Middleton, would it be fair to ask tenders for a construction program before doing an award to minimize the risk and test their capacity? Uwe, I don't know whether you've got any specific thoughts on that one. Two thoughts. Personally, I think it is a good idea that they can get an indicative program. I suspect mm -hmm. that master builders would probably object to that. Okay, right. I think in some government contracts, that's a prerequisite, if I'm not mistaken, mm. an indicative program. The government does things differently sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Um, how can we manage the building contract with the building mafia intruding in the business of a contractor on site? Asks John Vizinos. There's a heap of literature on that subject, which I could let you have and circulate those. Okay. But there, there are various people have written a long list of what you should do and starting with before you go on site during your design phase, even starting to talk to the potential stakeholders and finding out what skills they've got and the interests are and why they should be and shouldn't be involved and that you keep liaising with them until you've got a contract and that the contractor then takes over to try and recruit the 30% quota of people from that community, but that through the community liaison officer, you keep that community involved and informed of what's happening. To some extent, that seems to work if you can manage it that way. The other advice is that depending on the type of job you're doing, that you either got or both um, a couple of cameras that record the progress that are mounted on adjoining buildings or whatever, and all that you've got closed circuit television 
from a health and safety point of view, the site should be properly fenced anyway, and that there's an access control that if they come with a big horde, that doesn't necessarily stop anybody. And if you do get into that situation that the police is informed, and you certainly need to go and have a case number, and it is covered by Cessria Insurance. That's one of the reasons why we've got Cessria Insurance. But Cessria Insurance, amongst others, will have to have a case number from the police. Okay. Not an easy topic. Indeed. Uh, Maria, I don't know whether you've got the questions in front of you. This next one is from Roger Wimpy. I don't know whether you can see it. 15.04. And whether you'd yes, like to um, do it. If I may, Roger says, um, I find one of the failures of contracts is the failure of main contractors to make payments to the subcontractors. Can you comment on this? Um, how much time have we got? <laughs> I, I, I was in a long meeting yesterday, and it's it's a problem not only in South Africa, it's worldwide. And that's one of the reasons why the outlawing of the pay when paid clause is supposed to have come about in our country as well. And for probably 10, 12 years ago, the CIDB actually tried quite hard to go and get that going, and it never happened. That the meetings involving the whole industry were two or three hundred people to say why we need to have it. And even some very prominent legal people all of a sudden said, no, you don't actually need the clause. I think it's not been solved anywhere in the world. The suggestion in the UK has been to use a project bank account, that you pay the money into a bank account that is neutral and it's administered by the contract administrator or a trustee uh, as a lawyer to make the payments and that the money is available when it needs to be released. The master builders, domestic subcontractors got a clause in it that the contractor can withhold money until he's recovered money from the main and contractor, uh, from the employer. But the subcontractor has got a contract with the contract. He hasn't got a contract with the employer. So it's actually an contractor's responsibility to make sure subcontractors get paid. And virtually all the subcontract agreements, doesn't matter which one you're looking at, get modified by most of the big contractors, not all of them. Some of them are actually very honorable and go out of the way to also foster subcontractors. After all, about 80 to 90% of the work these days is done by subcontractors, that most principal contractors are actually construction managers rather than contractors. Mm. Um, thanks, Uwe. Um, Maria, thank you for that question. Ken Lieber um, wants to know, um, Uwe, whether you have a comprehensive checklist for inexperienced clients slash developers. And if I have to spend an extra day or two advising and guiding an inexperienced but enthusiastic client, do you think I should or ex should I, that might be charge extra or swallow it and just do it. Inexperience. Swallow it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Ken. Any comment? I think, I, isn't it in the latest SIA handbook? It certainly is in the old RIBA guide. I, I don't have the latest version that SIA has published, mm -hmm. but certainly in the Reba publications it's there. Mm. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, Krista Jager, um, uh, Maria, would you like to? Yes, Krista asks, thank you. Um, what happens to the retention of the contractor, of contractor one on the termination and a new contract is appointed? Luckily, I have never had to deal with such a problem in all my years, so I'm just wondering. Okay, you've got to go and do a final account. And the final account would be how much of the work has been done correctly. If there's some work that is defective, you could use some of that retention money to get that defective work repaired. If there is, if you can get to a clean cut of what is paid for and what you can use, and there's any money left over then that, of the retention, then that you would pay out to the contractor. But the important thing is we follow English law. Retention doesn't belong to the contractor. It belongs 
to the contract until it has been certified for payment. And whoever does the final account and principal agent should really issue that certificate. Once you've done the final account assessment, if there's any of the retention money left after you've done any repair work, then that should be paid out as part of the final account. Thanks. There might not be any left. Norbert Sulik, um, I think Norbert, you said you're from Australia. The worst is an uh, interference from competition, comp completion or competition. It happened to me on a 400 million rand project and through court action delayed, and through court actions delayed the project by about 18 months. I don't want to go into the detail but at the end of the day, it cost the client for payments for abortive work by the contractor and the professional team. And uh, Norbert, thank you for that comment. Um, and uh, thank you, Lula, for Can I your thanks. Can that? Yes, please. Uh, 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 Norbert, Norbert, Norbert and I work so, together. Yeah, you just added the, the project was completed successfully by the original contractor and the professional team. Carry on, uh, Uva. Yeah. Uh, Norbert and I work together in our practical year. Okay. Um, so it's a small world. But seeing Norbert is in Australia, if he looks up LC attorneys on, in Sydney, mm -hmm. they are excellent construction attorneys and the amount of publications they put out on the um, Australian regulations and how not to get into troubles is superb and it's free. Great. Uwe, thank you very, very much. Um, we've run out of time, uh, but uh, thank you for reminding us of the of the fundamentals of a good contract and um, and what what should we look out for. And um, do do also know, um, colleagues, that this recording will be available on the ECPD and SIA websites uh, within the next, at least within the next month, if not a couple of weeks. And you're most welcome to re-look at uh, Uber's um, presentation. So Uber, you and I are going to switch our cameras off and we're going to leave it to Maria to introduce our next presenter. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Hendrik Orit. He is a professional architect and academic. He studied architecture at the University of the Free State. His master's design dissertation won the 2006 National Coral Brick Architectural Student of the Year Award. After working with Root Architects in 2007, he accepted a junior lectureship at his alma mater in 2009. This was followed by Sergio Ninos in Canada from 2010 to 2013, during which time he commenced his PhD degree and was a studio instructor at the University of Calgary, Department of Environmental Design. On repatriation, excuse me, <clears throat> on repatriation in 2014, he re rejoined Ruth Architects as a professional architect. In 2015, he obtained a PhD with specialization in architecture. From 2016 to 2019, Henrik served as a postdoctoral research fellow and a part-time senior lecturer at the UFS Department of Architecture. In 2019, he published his first book, Christian Norbuk Schultz's Interpretation of Heidegger's Philosophy, Care, Place and Architecture. Henrik is a full-time senior lecturer at the UFS and serves as a chairperson of the Permit Committee of the Free State Provincial Heritage Resources Authority. He has also been awarded a Y2 rating from the National Research Foundation, the NRF. We look forward with anticipation to your presentation. Over to you, Henrik. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think most people in the audience are familiar with heritage legislation, but let me give a very short overview which should make it easier to understand the rest of my presentation. Heritage matters are legislated by the National Heritage Act of 1999. In broad terms, the act established SARA, the South African Heritage Resources Authority, 
as a parent organization responsible for the identification, assessment and management of heritage resources. Section 23 grants an MEC the right to establish a Provincial Heritage Resources Authority, PRA, responsible for the management of the relevant heritage resources within the province. If I understand correctly, this has been done in most provinces, but not all. And add to this the fact that SARA has delegated its functions and powers in different ways in different provinces, uh, and a rather involved picture emerges. I don't have time to unpack all these arrangements, and I'm not aware of all the permutations, but please familiarize yourself with the way heritage is managed in your province. In the Free State, the MEC established the Provincial Heritage Resources Authority and appoints a council every three years to oversee heritage matters in the province. The council appoints committees to administer specific functions, and architects deal most often with the permit committee. The key concern of our permit committee is to consider applications falling under section 34, which states that no person may alter or demolish any structure or part of a structure which is older than 60 years without a permit issued by the relevant Provincial Heritage Resources Authority. I think sections 35, 36, 37, 38 also deal with aspects that could potentially be very important to architects also note that section 45 grants the PRA the authority to issue compulsory repair orders if a heritage resource is neglected to such an extent that it will lose its potential for conservation. This can of course lead to more work for architects. If the act requires it, please apply timelessly for a permit because if work is done on a building or a site that is protected by the act and you do not have a permit, then you are working illegally, which could trigger a whole range of costly consequences. But enough about the legal requirements. I aim to use carrots, not sticks, to persuade you to talk to your heritage authorities, because I believe that negotiating heritage usually leads to better outcomes than legislating heritage. Where heritage is concerned, both the proof and the pudding are often in the process. The reason for this is that while heritage resources seem stable and predictable, their meanings migrate and their roles shift. Yet people care deeply about these things which they consider to be permanent aspects of their heritage. If British author Alain de Bouton asks, why are we vulnerable, so inconveniently vulnerable to what the spaces we inhabit are saying, then places of heritage amplify and densify our inconvenient vulnerabilities. If the meaning of a heritage resource has shifted or will shift due to a new development, then how can we poetically re-script heritage resources in a way that will broaden the heritage landscape, adhere to heritage legislation and dignify the lived vulnerabilities of all stakeholders? Today, I will briefly discuss three case studies where architects entered into creative dialogue with heritage authorities and managed to achieve this kind of poetic rescription. The first case study is the Princess Rose Garden, which was inaugurated on 25 May 1925 by the Prince of Wales and is located in King Edward VII Park, an, expense, an expansive cultivated landscape laid out in 1902 at, on the edge of Bloemfontein. The park was always seen as ornamental or an improved landscape. It needed constant intervention to keep up appearances. The Rose Garden can be seen as the pinnacle of these efforts. If you ever wondered why Bloemfontein is known as the City of Roses, then this garden with 3,000 rose bushes and a domed reception area played a big part in establishing the nickname. And yet, besides these photographs and Karl Schumann mentioning that it adhered to the jazz fashion of the time, the overall design was a bit of a mystery. Initially, I thought the original layout was lost to the forces of progress, since in the Mayor's Minute of 1938, it is mentioned that the garden was redesigned in that year and the old paths done away with. But one fortuitous day at the Free State Archive, I was handed a box containing 108 small uncatalogued aerial photographs of Bloemfontein taken between October 1935 and January 1936. 
In the following weeks, I stitched, stretched, lens corrected, blended and aligned these photographs to compose, as far as I know, the oldest complete aerial survey of Bloemfontein. Here was the park in 1936, and for the first time, the original layout of the Rose Garden. The garden was larger than life, but today you will only find the old reception area and no roses. At first, the demise of the Rose Garden was gradual. Decades of spatial fragmentation, ecological degradation, commercialization and neglect. But the straw that broke the camel's back was quite dramatic. In 2014, the last rose bushes were removed in order to host, of all things, an international beach volleyball tournament. An event even more foreign to the Free State ecology than a rose garden. I've uh, included the final scores if you were wondering about the outcome. The sand was removed, but the roses were never replanted. The rose garden is a significant but absent historical landscape. Would it be possible to reinstate and conserve an indigenous version of this garden while creatively rescripting it to form a more inclusive heritage area? In order to explore this question, I organized two events with my architecture students. The first year, we decided to chalk the outlines of the old rose garden. During our preparations, we realized that the geometries of the old layout harbored the possibility to be creatively fused with the Dutema decorative design language developed by the Basutu people of Central South Africa. The chalked rose garden could offer a fusion of design languages. After carefully sprinkling half a ton of chalk, the rescripting of the old shapes with the Tema infill made it possible to look beyond the prescriptions of the previous layout and reimagine the situation in terms of more ways of knowing. The second event encouraged a more sustained and dynamic engagement with the Tema. One of the goals was to explore the capacity of this design language that is usually confined to two-dimensional wall applications to inspire three-dimensional structures. Rather than again looking at the whole ensemble, we decided to focus on one of the round planting beds. The challenge was to erect a temporary structure that could give a compelling voice to the embedded design disciplines of the tema. While building this structure, contemporary the tema designs were painted and later exhibited as part of the new three-dimensional presence. Ultimately, the goal was to acknowledge overlaps between distinct design languages, but also to venture between the pitfall, beyond the pitfalls of cultural appropriation by inceptually drawing on the act of making itself as a pathway to the openness of listening. In this case, it was primarily amid the venturesome goal-defying temporary acts of making that designers could transcend the univocality of colonial landscapes and become open to more inclusive and transformative dialogues. The second case study refers to two rather ordinary buildings in a special neighborhood of Bloemfontein called West Dean. The area was originally characterized by humble residences with formal frontages located close to the street and an intimate scale. However, the area is on the northern edge of Bloemfontein CBD and for the past 30 to 40 years, it has experienced enormous developmental pressure. In this case, the developer wanted to demolish two existing houses and maximize the development potential of the land. Of course, the developer pointed to the two large neighboring contemporary buildings and argued that the old houses were out of scale and out of touch with the current reality. The architects proposed the following design. On the other hand, the permit committee pointed to the rest of the street and argued that actually the two neighboring buildings were out of scale and insensitive to the fine woven urban fabric of the streetscape. At this stage, a respected heritage consultant was consulted. He pointed out that while he understood the argument of the permit committee, the two houses, houses could not really be seen as significant heritage resources. And yes, we had to admit that these were not buildings that could be declared. And yet they were emblematic of a way of life that resonated with the neighborhood. So we tried to find a hybrid solution. First, we asked the architect to redesign the facade in such a way that the spatial memory of the two houses was acknowledged. 
Second, we asked them to reconsider the way the building relates to the sidewalk and street. And lastly, we compiled a salvage report identifying fittings and finishes from the old houses that had to be reused in the new development, a site-specific form of memory transfer. In the end, we moved from this design to a much more finely textured facade. The refined design recalled the massing of the original buildings, and these volumes housed small businesses, thereby enlivening the street edge. In terms of the salvage report, the old pressed metal ceilings were reused in the main entrance foyer and in each of the small business areas. Furthermore, the old wooden floors were reused as ornamental wall coverings and various salvaged fireplaces were inserted at key locations in the new building. Here, the re-scripting process asked that architects and permit committee agree on the inceptual content of the original that needed to be preserved. The third case asks how one can poetically re-script heritage resources rendered divisive by societal transformation. In front of the main building of the University of the Free State stood the statue of President M. T. Stain. Stain was the last president of the Republic of the Orange Free State. His larger than life statue was provided a prominent plinth and placed at the culmination of the ceremonial access leading to the UFS main building. The statue provoked some students and they demanded it be removed. Others saw it as an important heritage market, marker. A third group hoped to modify the statue and realign it with contemporary expectations. How could this conflict be resolved while adhering to heritage laws and without alienating a significant portion of the student body. After violent student demonstrations, the rector, Francis, Professor Francis Peterson, established a task team that proposed three courses of action to the permit committee. First, fencing in the stand statue. Second, the idea of placing information boards around the statue as information exchange and as a barrier. And third, covering the statue completely and removing it from public view. The permit committee rejected these proposals and challenged the university management to consider a more creative approach. As a thought experiment, they proposed placing a reflective prism in front of the statue. On an inceptual level, the goal of the prism was to challenge the dominant position of the statue by visually removing it from the main historical axis on campus, thereby emphasizing other kinds of views. The prism proposal was intended merely as an example but unexpectedly, the UFS task team decided to construct it. The prism re-scripted the statue. When walking towards the main building, one now merely saw shifting images of the reflected surroundings. Against the unquestionable prominence of the usual frontal approach towards the statue, it could now only be approached obliquely. As one walked around the prism, the statue would suddenly appear with an abruptness that the original situation never afforded. This sudden moment of revelation was contrasted by a more pensive moment of reflection when one tried to take in the vista back towards Bloemfontein. One now faced the flat side of the prism and could see yourself, yourself standing next to this distorted statue. It was strange to see how the statue now seemed oddly vulnerable and liberated from the symbol systems and power structures that had kept it in place. During construction, the task team placed seats around the new ensemble. It was now possible to linger in a dignified way in front of the main building. Students took full advantage, and soon there were administrators complaining of the noise created by those sitting around the statue. A small but telling victory. The prism stood in front of the statue from the end of June until mid-September 2019 and stimulated widespread debate. After the public participation process was concluded, and following in-depth consultation with the Stain family, the university management and Free State Heritage agreed that the removal of the statue was the preferred way forward. The statue was dismantled on 27 June 2020 and reconstructed at the War Museum of the Boer Republics in Bloemfontein, where the statue creates a visual connection between the museum and the adjacent Women's Memorial, a memorial that Stain played a key role in founding. Critics could probably say that the idea to move the statue to the War Museum was already suggested before the prism was erected. So did the installation have a meaningful impact? 
Besides inviting people to carefully consider their opinions, I would argue that the prism offered a gift akin to creative writing. The English novelist E.M. Foster, while considering the ways to link moments within a story, once noted that a particular aspect of the story might have been shown by the novelist straight away at the start of the book. Only if the novelist had shown it straight away, it would never have become beautiful. The prism rescripted the holding sway of the statue in such a way that its relocation could be seen by all sides as something beautiful. Interestingly, the relocation of the statue once more opened possibilities for rescription, since the permission for relocation granted by the permit committee was subject to the reinterpretation of the site into a symbolic inclusive public space. Deciding on an appropriate way to reinterpret the site has proven challenging, but fear not, the university appointed another task team. But in the meantime, the hole left by the removal of the statue was paved over with red pavers matching the rest of the square. At first, I considered this a lost opportunity, but I later had to reconsider my position when I was asked by the task team to perform an interpretive deep mapping of the square. On the first afternoon of this mapping exercise, I was amazed to find that a group of students had organized a Jerusalem dance challenge on the repaved area in front of the main building. It slowly dawned on me that they could not be doing this dance in this iconic location if the statue was still there. They were dancing the openness created by rescription and relocation. Yet their venturesomeness was marked by its own kind of vulnerability. The dance challenge depends on participants standing in a square grid. And after the students finished, I walked over the square and saw that they had struck small gold stars in a grid pattern to mark their positions. Those shiny stars reflected the sky in a way that echoed something elemental about the prism process. While we are still searching for a way to creatively reinterpret the place where the stained statue used to stand, the prism found a way to draw close the way we live in marked places as beings marked by the vulnerabilities gathered in our care-infused histories. These examples show three ways in which engagement between architects and heritage bodies led to poetic rescriptions. They are poetic in the sense that they draw on poesis, the ancient Greek word for all kinds of making. Even if that calls for half a ton of chalk to make a point, or a salvage report in order to make a plan, or a reflective prism to remake a visual access. My call today is for creative participation between architects and heritage bodies. People care about architectural heritage in different ways, but architects are often the facilitators of dialogue between clients and heritage authorities. If we can creatively recognize each other's inconvenient vulnerabilities as outpourings of care, we may be able to further amplify our deep connections with heritage resources as a wellspring for poetic rescription. Thank you very much. There we are. <clears throat> Hendrik, that was uh, very, very thought provoking. Thank you so much for that. Um, Maria, uh, how do you respond to what Hendrik has just shared with us? <laughs> well, I can say it's really beautiful and amazing. I mean, it truly really is poetic. Um, and I think you're right that that engagement. Often I think we, we see heritage as this huge stumbling block rather than as an opportunity. Quite, quite. Okay, yeah, colleagues, and, and, uh, yeah, Linda, please. No, I mean, the, this is the point I'm trying to make is that it, it can be different. Um, yes, there are some buildings that are key heritage buildings. Um, but uh, in our case, I don't know in other PCs, but we generally try and work with people. Uh, the real issues only come in when people work illegally and then there's remedial action required, and, you know, uh, and then it becomes really difficult uh, because money is involved and cost runs every day. What I think was interesting is your involvement of community and back to the word stakeholders and how important that role is. Yeah, it, it was weird with with all of these, you know, 
the people are not aware of the full stories usually of these heritage markers um and they the moment you create a different kind of situation everyone takes notice um, and people engage in different ways for instance with the stone statue it was very weird to see the way people sort of were taken aback at first and then started walking around the thing and yeah it, it, i think it tells the story in a different way and sometimes we need to do that before we ask someone's opinion about something and it was a, that's a win-win situation okay um i'm going to try and um read a uh, ken um ken lever ken you've made a comment um and I'm trying to get the gist of it. It, 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 it relates to the 60 years, um, Ken Achim Hendrik. Any thought about the very limiting 60-year rule? Anything before 1964 is now covered by this requirement. Okay, yeah. maybe your comment on that? I, I am not in a position to do anything about that law, but yeah. um, we are starting to struggle because large neighborhoods are suddenly all older than 60 years. So um, I think uh, the heritage bodies will have to consider that. Um, the reason for the 60 year clause is to cast a broad net, right? Mm. Uh, because we were, we heritage people aren't aware of all the heritage buildings and all the significant stories. And often it's only when things are changed that we you know, have a, in, uh, a reason to go and do the research. Yeah. Um, and and due to that, we found some incredible buildings in the past where the stories we weren't aware of. And there's, of course, something that I couldn't even touch on today, but all the heritage buildings in, uh, in uh, the previously sort of informal settlements. Yeah. I mean, this is, a, this is a whole field of such a interesting, different kinds of heritage stories. Um, that I don't think we've sort of figured out how to deal with them. Um, mm. But but that is why I still think the 60 year clause is, is valuable because mm. it opens us up to different kinds of stories that we might not always uh, realize uh, at first. Great. Um, Hendrik, thank you. I just want to run through some of these. Maria, if you pardon me. Limpopo uh, Polokwane approval to demolish heritage buildings has been approved without attention to public response and in the shortest time in the history. Niels could see it. Niels, thank you for that comment. Uh, it's tragic. Um, I have a special interest back in Polokwane and um, that's, that's so sad. Vivian Hobbs, um, just a comment, Hendrik. Amazing, thank you very much. And then Maria, I don't know whether you'd like to take Norbert's um, comment again. Sure. Um, he says uh, it is, it's interesting to note that very recently there are attacks on colonial statues here in Melbourne. Anti-colonial group did cut statues of Captain Cook and Queen Victoria off their pedestals. So there's no question there, just a comment. No, it's, it's happening the world over. Um, and it, and it's, it is such a difficult situation to, um, to work in because the, the views are so uh, polarizing. So uh, we, we were actually struggling here. What we were actually looking for is an alternative conflict resolution method. I mean, that's, that's what, what prompted the, 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 the prison, right? Um, yeah, and, and in the free state, we don't often know what we're not allowed to do. So then we just do things and Sometimes they work out quite interestingly. <laughs> right. Okay. Great. Um, um, Yusuf uh, Wadi says, "Wow, Hendrik, well done. Thank you, Yusuf." Lisu Mu Um, thank you, Hendrik. We really need more of your energy and wisdom in heritage. Ken, um, thank you for your further comment. Um. Uh, Johan Paansegrou says, wow, Hendrik, um, ek het hier die aanbieding baie waardeer. I really appreciated the presentation. 
uh, says Alan Middleton. Thank you. Susan Willers, um, Webb. Amazing poetic. Yes, thank you. Alma Mater. Marella, uh, the side note, interesting solutions and creative thinking. Thank you. Um, Andre Grissel, 60 years. Is that a revolving timeline? Or can we set it back to a specific date? Hendrik, it's revolving, isn't it? Yeah, it is revolving. And, and you know what's mm. interesting, what's starting to happen now is sort of modern buildings, right? That, mm. that are good examples of early modernism. Well, at this time, basically late modernism. I think yeah. we're just about there to protect uh, Welcome Vess, for instance, mm. under the 60 years clause. So, mm. you know, buildings by Eitan Burghardt are suddenly becoming heritage. And that's why mm. the 60 years thing helps. Um, I mean, well, yeah, sorry. I, I, I like the fact that, that we sort of broaden the heritage landscape rather than sort mm. of constricting it. Mm. Okay, Maria Christa Jager um, asks a okay. question. Chris say, asks, why don't local authorities appoint knowledgeable persons to conduct surveys and identify and list worthy buildings so that not all buildings over 60 years need to get approval for what are really minor alterations? Um, for example, changing out buildings. Um, to granny flats. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question, and the act does uh, provide for that. Um, I mean, I think that was the intention initially, is that that would happen, and in some provinces, obviously, it did happen. So in the Western Cape, they do have a register mm -hmm. uh, registration of, you know, uh, buildings. Uh, the rest of the in the Free State, we've got the gradings, grading three, two, one, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, that's just for like really important heritage buildings and it's weird so if, if you look at the second example in west dean um, that was a that was a neighborhood that had a certain feeling to it a certain sense of place but none of the buildings were like there's two or three buildings that one could declare in that neighborhood so by right what should have happened 30 years ago is they should have declared it a heritage area and then they should have Created uh, guidelines, and to ex an extent, they did try and do that. And of course, developers then found loopholes in between the guidelines, and then you have a whole range of unanticipated consequences. And in a way, the sort of ad hoc approach we're using at the moment uh, can work pretty effectively. Uh, but yeah, uh, right. what, the other answer is just resources. Um, yeah, uh, in the free state, we're like, you know, a committee that gets paid ad hoc to just sort of go through these things. And everything else you do is uh, for the love of it. Hendrik, um, I'm just going to acknowledge the contributions. We've run out of time, but um, Joy Brasler, Billy James, um, Sunette de Foss, Annie de Toy, Zante Rademeyer, Steve Archer, Alan Middleton again, Daniel Kruger. To all of you, thank you very much for 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 commenting. Um, I'm just going to leave um, you, Hendrik, with this one thought. You know, since I was, um, um, shall I say, sensitized to the importance of listening in conflict, it made it opened a new world to me listening and uh, actively trying to understand the other party. And that probably touches on what you have also shared with us. So colleagues, on behalf of all of you uh, with Hendrik and Uwe on screen, I just want to say thank you very much to Hendrik and Uwe. Just to remind you, it, um, takes time to do these presentations and they do them for us, for our edification um, with no compensation and just for the love of the matter. And that's where Sire Share comes in, uh, the desire to share. So um, I again, am going to then 
uh, allow uh, Maria and Hendrik and, and, and Uwe to uh, close their cameras and I'm just going to then wrap up. We trust we've, you've enjoyed the afternoon with us. Uh, as mentioned, SciShare carries a category one CPD value of 0.1, which is not much, but if you attend more than one session in a year, you actually accumulate your points. We invite you to join us again on the first Friday of May, not the first of May, the first Friday of May, which is the third of May. Our guests will be Dunette Werkman, who will speak on how their practice brings architecture to the people. Actually, a very interesting presentation. And then a personal colleague, friend, Walter Ringelman, is an engineer with a wealth of experience in airport design. His topic is astonishing architecture, exceptional engineering. Um, Walter has worked internationally and he's going to be sharing with us. This afternoon, we are again encouraged by artist Charlie Mackesy. The little boy asks the mole, how do you make a good molehill? Uh, by making a lot of bad ones first, answers the mole. So if you haven't made a good building yet, just take heart. Once you've made enough bad buildings, you're going to hit the jackpot and make that one special one. Um, I bid you a pleasant weekend. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in May again. Bye-bye.